Express Outdoors has a really cool segment that we call Beyond the Boat. This personal sit-down one-on-one conversation with our featured guests allows us to explore the other side of who this person really is. We get a chance to delve into their personal and professional life, why they got into the outdoor industry, and what makes them who they are today. Join us as we get a bit beyond the boat with Express Outdoors. So we just wrapped up an alligator hunt here at Gros Savon yesterday with Mark Copley of Strike King Lure Company and Lou's. And uh, you know, Mark yourself, as well as many of our guests, uh, always have a thousand questions on an alligator hunt with all about from the science behind the alligators and why we harvest them and all the things involved. And they kind of sparked a thought in my mind it would be really cool to bring in Mr. Ted Johannan here who is a longtime friend of Gros Savon. And, uh, and uh, has done a lot of consulting work for us over the years. And he actually has been around a long time, not, not to joke that you're an old guy, but, but you have. And, and you're a wealth of information. You're kind of the, the father of alligators, so, so to say. And, and you've, uh, you've been very instrumental in bringing back the season to Louisiana. And, and you've actually sparked, if not overseen, a lot of the research with alligators. And so with, with all that being said, uh, we wanted to just sit down with you today and just pick your brain during this interview and, yeah. and see uh, if, if you don't mind, give us a little history on the alligator and where did all this start from? You know, we just didn't start alligator hunting yesterday. No, no, the alligator was first used in commercial channels in about 1850. The Indians used them for shoes and things like that. And they found out they were not waterproof. So they stopped using them altogether. 1860 to 1865 was the Civil War. And as we were cut off from the trade routes from the North, we couldn't get leather. So the Southern troops used the, mo the, the leather that was available to them, which was alligator. And they built saddles out of it. They built gun, sa uh, gun holsters out of it and things like this. After the Civil War, it kind of rallied the interest in alligators. And in 1875, the Louisiana alligator was first shipped into Europe for commercial sales. Uh, we had some very elite tanneries in New Jersey and New York, but the Europeans also wanted them. You got to remember, Doug, the alligator is the diamond of the leather industry. It's number one. Uh, porosis in Australia is a big, beautiful skin, brings a lot more money, but the numbers aren't there. We, today, we, we're shipping three, 400,000 skins out of Louisiana into the European markets. So it, it worked out real good, and it stimulated a lot of interest. Now, you got to remember there was no season, no regulation. You could kill them as long as there was a price on their head, and they did that, and the population crashed. The turn of the century, 1900, was when there were so few alligators left in the state, they began this embossed printing on cattle hides, putting the alligator pattern on a cow hide. Uh, McElhenney, over here on Avery Island, and the father of the Tabasco sauce, wrote probably the best book we have on alligators today, The Alligator Life History. And he put a bunch of things in there, growth, nesting, and, and it, it really opened up a lot of people's eyes. And it showed that somewhere between 1900 and 1940, there was about three and a half million gators killed in the state of Louisiana and shipped out to various industries. The population couldn't handle that. And what it did, it crashed. So, in 1943, the buyers came in and started buying gators a little differently. They bought by the linear foot. Before that, they bought by the piece. From 1875 up to 1940, you got one price per four-footer. I think the price per four-footer was somewhere around 15 cents a piece. Uh, Five-footers were 20 cents a piece. So it didn't bring much money, but by buying it by the foot in the 40s brought a whole new world of, of uh, hunters in 
to, to use the alligator. And also, it was gaining interest all throughout the world. Uh, in 1945, the state of Louisiana keeps severance tax records on every piece of fur that was sold and shipped, every alligator, uh, and they charge a tax, 10 cents a piece, I think, something like that. But it gets them to go in there and look at those books to get numbers from these big buyers and tanners. And we, in 45, we shipped something like 50,000 alligators out of the state of Louisiana. 1960, 1,600. So you could see it just going down. So I started with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries as a biologist at Rockefeller Refuge in 1960. I did my master's work there and then they hired me on as a biologist in 63. And what the season was closed in 1962 to protect the alligator and give it time to rebuild. So we went to the literature and tried to find out how do you manage alligators. And there was absolutely nothing. You couldn't really hang your hat on any good concrete data. So we had to do it at Rockville. And it was, um, my whole career was spent on alligator research. And it was very interesting, very rewarding. But we developed methods of survey. We developed methods of movement, habitat preference, diets, nesting, spermatogenesis, ovulation. Um, all these things that would affect the management of that alligator. And once we got it all done and the season was closed from 1962 to 1972, in 1972, we were waist deep in alligators. We had to do something. Now, the community, the international community and the national communities, Fish and Wildlife Service and, and uh, National Audubon and all these people felt that the alligator could only be managed under total protection. He's not a renewable resource. You cannot harvest a long-lived animal like the alligator. It takes them 13, 14 years to reach sexual maturity. So you can't do it. It's too involved. But we felt we had a system. We researched it with the s surveys, and I felt that we were ready to try a harvest in 1972. I think when you look at the Fish and Wildlife Service and Defenders of Wildlife, New York Zoological Society, National Audubon, they wanted to put it on a pedestal. We're just going to make it a non-renewable resource. And that's short-sighted. And the Fish and Wildlife Service is short-sighted at times. And we had lots of trouble getting the alligator moved to where we could harvest it. Again, Going back to the early 60s, uh, the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson was published. And that was the problems with DDT and chlorinated hydrocarbons, massive fish kills on the mouth of the Mississippi River, brown pelicans dying because the eggshells were too thin. And so when we closed the alligator season and we asked the general public, to help us protect them, they were ready because Rachel Carson already gave them the map how to do it. So it wasn't a big problem with us to put the alligator uh, in, a, in a management program. Now, in December of 1973, President Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act for the alligator. The alligator was on it. Worse. So, so was it ever only endangered species or was it just a threatened species? No, it was an endangered species in 1973 okay. and we could not hunt in 74. We had to get it off that. And what irritated me so much, we were out in the marsh, we were doing nesting surveys and we had bunches of alligators. When, when you talk about an endangered animal, you talk about mortality exceeding reproduction. So if you graph that out, it's going to zero. So we just got interrupted by an afternoon thunder shower, which is typical for South Louisiana in late summertime. So we've moved around the corner at the lodge and reset up to where we're outside of the blowing rain. And uh, 
when we, we left off a while ago, we had mentioned that the alligator had made it to the endangered species list. Right. The, you got to remember, the endangered species list was a federal list. The state of Louisiana never agreed with it because they never did fe feel that the alligator was endangered. So, but when it went on the list, the state lost complete control on the alligator. We had to get permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service to do alligator research. And it's the biggest mess you ever wanted to see. So we started the delisting process. And the delisting process was kind of like going to court and you submitting data to show that the alligator was in good shape and didn't belong on the list. And of course, they had scientists saying, well, we need more data, we need more data. And anyway, we finally got them to agree that the alligator was not endangered. In 1975, it came on off the list. So we started hunting alligators again. But the real trick to hunting alligators, it was control of the harvest. You know, alligators in the past were hunted at night, God knows where, all over. They had very little controls. This hunt in 72, we started with a fishing method where you'd bait a hook, put the hook out. So the hunter had to come back to those hooks every day. And it brought him into the management area of the landowner. The landowner could direct him, tell him what to do, how to do it. And that's what was good. The uh, alligator program moved ahead. We, we really had good success. And, but the tag is what really saved the alligator. It was a serial number tag that you put in the tail of the alligator and it has the state of Louisiana on it and then it has a number. And that number will go into a computer and you can go to Rockefeller and look up any number you want this year or for the past 40 years as to where the alligators went that were killed on Sweet Lake Land and all. So it's real good. But the most important thing, it's how you stop the hunting. Once you get 3,000 alligator hunters out there killing every day, how do you stop them? You know, as long as there's a good price, you're going to get some people break the law and continue to sell. But when they use up all their tags, they can't hunt anymore. And this Louisiana passed Act 550 in the early 70s. Extremely strong regulations to where the state had the right to set seasons, bag limits and quotas, but they also had penalties in there. And the common penalty for gator hunting was confiscation of all equipment and mandatory jail sentence. So it, it kind of broke them from sucking eggs. Uh, one of the early violations I recall uh, caught on Pecan Island was the local agents at Rockefeller caught him and he went to jail for five years and three months. That you don't see, but we sent a message to everybody that the alligator is going to be managed and it's going to be done right. And, and all the management and all the regulations and all the studies are done by professional wildlife biologists. So I think it, it's, it's in good hands. So that, and that's a question I always get. We had <coughs> talked about the tag yesterday on our Express Outdoor yep. show. So how does somebody get a tag? Because that's a question. What, what okay. is the process? Where does all that come from? Okay, the alligator is a product of the land. So 80% of the land in coastal Louisiana is privately owned, like Sweet Lake Land and different land companies across the coast. So the land company will then go to the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and submit their tax receipts. That shows section range and township how much marsh they have, and we do every 10 years update a vegetative type map. We fly the whole coast, determine the vegetation, whether it's deteriorating, whether it's building, and that way we can then apply tag quotas to that marsh type map, and that will then 
allow us to kill gators in proportion to their existence in the population in that habitat type. So it works out real well. And Doug, since 1972 to today, to today we killed over one million alligators in the state of Louisiana. And you should have heard some of the hoorah in 1970 and 71 when we first started talking about killing alligators. The Defenders of Wildlife, New York Zoological Society, Friends of Animals, the Fish and Wildlife Service, National Audubon Society, all said Louisiana's going to mess up all the good we did, which they didn't do a damn thing. Uh, they passed some laws, and they had a very... Uh, a lot of interest in it, but physically they didn't do anything out in the marsh. No research, no surveys, or nothing else. We did all that. So Louisiana had the handle on the population, size, class, frequency, and population distribution. So we felt in 1972 we're going to step out and allow hunters in Cameron Parish, one parish, to harvest alligators. We picked Cameron Parish because the people in Cameron Parish were 110 percent behind the program. They wanted alligators, they lived on alligators all their life, and they wanted to see it back in sustainable numbers. So we picked Cameron, we killed 1,300 alligators the first year in 1972. They were bought by the French, Garden Soise, and they all went into Paris. Uh, to be made into leather products. But ever since that, and the tags were recorded by the state, they were also recorded by the Fish and Wildlife Service when it left the state, and it also recorded by the Convention on International Treaties in the international market. So we kind of had the alligator in an enclosed system. There was no way for poachers to get in there. They couldn't break that system. And it worked real well. We've been hunting alligators since 72. Populations continue to increase at a rate of about five to 10% every year. Every year the population's going up, provided the habitat is good. Now, this summer we went through a drought period. Nesting wasn't as good as it was in the past, but that's an environmental issue. And once you get, start getting rains like this and start getting standing water, next spring it ought to be a good nesting year. So it, it worked out real well. And I think we were successful in showing that the alligator is renewable. When you look at, and we've been hunting since 1972, the size class frequency of the 9s, 10s, 11s, there's just as many of those animals showing up today as they did in 1972. So I think the recruitment is moving those big gators into those larger size classes faster than hunting mortality. So we got the right formula for the harvest. We're harvesting three to five percent of the total population. A very small percentage, but it's good enough. The landowner can make a few dollars. The hunters can make a few dollars in these local communities and keep these kids here. Keep them in Cameron Parish. Let them, let them enjoy the beauty of Cameron Parish and some of the natural resources of Cameron Parish. So we, we've done, uh, and, and it's worked out very well. Uh, along with that, the Quipper, the Coastal Restoration Program, right. is rebuilding a lot of these coastal marshes. So there are rebuilding alligator habitat by the day. So this is helping the alligators. Right. And also too, the the alligator is is been produced for thousands of years. He's alive and well. He's not being over harvested. And between the farming program and I'll get into that a little later, and the wild harvest we're generating over $100 million a year to the state of Louisiana. So I think the alligator is paying his way. Yeah. And not only is he helping himself, but all the organisms, the birds, the wading birds, the shorebirds, the ducks, that use that ecosystem is benefiting from what the alligator is being 
uh, what she's being paid for. Right. Now, if, if the general public wants to help an alligator, and I get that question a lot, how can we help? Well, I tell them, if you want to help an alligator, buy a handbag. <laughs> because that money comes down to the landowner. And he will then invest it back in marsh management, keeping these marshes wet and wild. Yeah. That's the future of the alligator. Yeah. And if we don't look out for the future, and if we continue to have this sustainable harvest, the alligator's going to be alive and well. You know, as, as a kid, I actually made my first hunt in 1977. Uh, I didn't, at the time, I was too young to really fully understand what was going on, and, and until I met you and talked about this, yeah. I had no clue that it actually had just restarted the season only a few years before that. Right. So, so I kind of right. came in as a youngster on the on the beginning of the the way we yeah. do things now. And so, you 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 just mentioned handbags and. Through gross of on, a lot of our customers that harvest alligators will end up with a pair of boots or a handbag good, or belts. Good. But a lot of the majority of the alligators, because you, you kind of quoted a number, what's our annual harvest of alligators in the About state? 35,000. 35, so what does that actually get to do? Most people don't realize that those gator hives end up at high-end fashion houses. They, um, go, they go into Europe to the very high-end Hermes's and these people that they way above me. And, and they make these very beautiful handbags and leather and leather goods. The farming industry all goes into the watch trap market. That's where they go. So it, it's interesting about, from my perspective as a biologist, we're harvesting alligators down to the nearest one. No other harvest program, you go out and you shoot a bunch of ducks, every day every day and you end up with a figure but we can tell you before the season starts we're going to harvest this many alligators and that's the beauty part about the tag mm -hmm. and also you can go to europe and get a tag and come back and run it through department of wildlife and fisheries computer and those folks at rockefeller uh, lisa ann she can tell you exactly who that tag was issued to what gator hunter killed it and where it came from. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a lot of protection is built in. And that's the interesting part about the alligator yeah. program. And that's why it's successful. <clears throat> uh, there are many, many people involved in the recovery of the alligator. No one person did it. Uh, the, the Act 550 took a bunch of smart lawyers to write it. It took a bunch of good court prosecution to book these guys and put them in jail. It, also had a tremendous interest in the landowner to rebuild this population because that was added income for them. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a lot of people involved and, and that's trying to keep that interest alive is a big job mm -hmm. and you get these years when the prices are down a little bit it's hard to stimulate these people to get up but they do because they love the marsh they love hunting alligators and and that's their way of life. Yeah. They're going to do it. So I know one of the things, two years ago, when, when we used to hunt, you, you'd only catch what you could skin that day. Yeah. But nowadays, the, the skinning, the art of skinning has gone away because we actually sell the alligators whole now. Yeah. Because is, is that because of the meat aspect of it? The meat aspect is worth some years a million dollars a year just off the meat. And the skins, the, uh, the alligator, the whole carcass, or iced in trucks and brought to skinning sheds. They're professionals. They don't make a mistake. And if they do, their name's on that gate. So they won't be skinning long. And it, it helps out to get a uniform product out of, out of the alligator. So it works out real well. But the farming end, some more of our research, when we were doing mortality rates and life tables of alligators, how long they live, how many die each year. Dave Taylor, uh, a biologist in Monroe, found out and did some tremendous work. He found out that 85% of the alligators from the egg to four feet long die every year. Think of you running a business and you lost 85% of your wow. business. You couldn't do it for very long, but alligators do this. So what we said when Dave found this out, I said, okay, rather than lose it, let's use it. 
let's make it legal for people to go out and pick these eggs up, pay the landowner, bring them into a farm, the guidelines that we wrote for the farm, so it'd be a humane methods of slaughter and proper caring and hot water and all. And they are now producing 300,000 skins a year out of Louisiana. We're producing more skins than the entire continent of Africa we're producing here in Louisiana. So it shows that we can use them and we don't hurt them. So, you know, you, you're throwing these numbers out. Uh, in comparison to other states, do, are there seasons? And I know obviously Florida has a big alligator population. How does Louisiana season compare to the other states? Well, Louisiana has more marsh than anybody. So we have more alligators than anybody. Uh, Florida has a bunch of lake regions, and they, population-wise, probably are almost equal to us. But they don't harvest their alligators like we do. I was always concerned to prevent alligator fatality. So I issued tags on rivers where people did a lot of water skiing, swimming, and I said, I want you to get those alligators out of there so we don't have a human-alligator conflict. Alligators belong in the marsh, but as a population increases, they push out into God knows anywhere, any good lake, you'll find an alligator. And all that's well and good, but if it conflicts with people, that's where the alligator's going to lose. So we try and remove him from that situation, and that has worked out real well. So you talked about moving, and I know you guys did some really cool studies when you were at Rockefeller. You had told me one time a story that y'all had put some telemetry on a 10-footer and followed yeah. him for one night. Yeah. And you had told me, how many miles did that gator travel? He went from Rockefeller up into Grand Lake and back to Rockefeller, about 15 miles in one night. In one night, he traveled one that far. Time. But he yeah. made a complete circle and ended back yeah. at his home and territory. And then he came back and come hibernating time, he crawled over the levee and went into his hole he's been using for 20 years. So they, they got good homing instinct. So you just sparked a question for me because I was actually asked this yesterday by Mark and I really couldn't answer it. And I'm, I've been alligator hunting my whole life. What does an alligator do when he actually hibernates? Does he, does he go underwater? Can yeah, he breathe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the alligator's heartbeat today September is beating 30 beats a minute. Now, as the water temperature cools, that heart rate cools because he's part of the environment. He's a cold-blooded animal. His heartbeat will go from 30 beats a minute during the winter to 3 beats a minute. Wow. It's, it's like in slow motion. Now, in the summer, an alligator can stay underwater probably a big gate of 10 footer, two and a half hours. During the winter, he can stay underwater 48 hours because his metabolism is so slowed up. So he, he, can, he gets along real well. So we always, the locals talk about alligator holes and those are things where we know that an alligator's bird, kind of like a, a rat would dig a hole in the ground. We see those things. So does that alligator actually go in there and did, did, does he come back up above the water line yeah. and stay there for the winter? He'll come up and during the winter months all his movement is vertical. Just going up and it takes him during the winter at three beats a minute, it takes him almost 24 hours to fill his lungs up. Wow. So he sits there when, and then he goes back down. So in Louisiana obviously we have some crazy temperature changes in December and we can still run in our air conditioner at, at yeah. Christmas time. So the smaller the alligator, we see those still come out in January. Yeah, that, that's the, metabolic, the metabolic rate of a small alligator is probably twice that of a big game. Just like a kid, you know, he's eating all the time and running, and we couldn't keep up with him. But alligators have the same metabolic rate, pretty much the same. But one thing we found with alligators, we started looking at the incubation temperature of the egg. And the egg, the, the genetics of alligators, uh, sex is not determined by the chromosomes. There's no sex chromosomes in alligators. 
they are determined by incubation temperature of the egg. As it heats up to about 89 degrees, all those gators are going to be males. As it comes down to 85 degrees, all those alligators are going to be females. Now, it also involves their metabolic rate. How fast they grow, how much their heart beats, and, and how fast they convert food into energy. So, we can now control the metabolic rate of the alligator in the incubation temperature of the egg. So we can make fast growing gators or slow growing gators by how you set that incubator. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely important for alligator farming. Right. They can get, wild gator grows about six to eight inches a year. So hatched out in September, in the early spring, he'll be about six to uh, eight to 10 inches long. Whereas a farm gator picked up, hatched, and raised in controlled environment, chimney, heated tank, he'll be up to four feet long in a year. So the information you just gave us is based on the farming, ranching of an alligator. How does that relate back to the wild? An alligator actually makes a mound out of grass to lay her eggs, and, right. and those eggs are, are inside that fermenting in, material kind of being right. heated with those temperatures you talked about, gives you a variation right. of and sexes. If you look at a clutch of alligator eggs, it's about the size of a soccer ball. Uh, and they lay 35, 36, 38 eggs. And as you stratify that egg cavity, that nest, the bottom could be cooler than the top. So they're going to be the females, the tops are going to be the males. Right. So you're getting a normal hatch rate from those alligators. So and it, it was uh, kind of confusing when we stir first stumbled on this. You know, just what the heck was going on. But uh, we, we brought in some people from Belfast Island, Dr. Mark Ferguson, and he was a genius. And between Larry McNeese and myself and Mark, we worked all this out. So why September? Why do we hunt in September? Okay, we hunt in September because that's after the hatching. They lay in June. Take 65 days, so they're going to be hatching out in late August. So we don't want to kill that female until she opens that nest. If we do kill her, but we want to protect her. So by September, she has moved back into the isolated areas where the nest are, and our hunters are unable to go in there. So she's protected, mm -hmm. and she will live to nest again and again and again. I know when we're bass fishing here at Gros Savon, usually March, 1st of April, you hear the big males bellering. Bellering, that's the courtship. And is that when they actually do the mating process? Yeah, they'll, they'll bellow and they'll set up a territory. And it's, for males, it's big open water. It's a canal or lake or something like that. And he'll bellow and that female will come to him. And they did some work at Rockefeller that showed that in alligators there's a pair bond. That female is going to the same male every year, every year, every year. So there is pair bonds in alligators. You wouldn't think that alligators would form a pair bond, but they do. So, and it's interesting to see the male alligator is only sexually active for two weeks out of the year. So you got a narrow wind of courtship, a narrow wind of copulation, narrow wind of, of, of laying, so all these eggs are gonna hatch pretty much at the same time. So we know when to set the season mm -hmm. without hurting these, these females. And so I guess to do a, a recap of the whole year of an alligator, we're looking at a, a springtime mating, a June laying of the eggs, an yeah. August hatching, and in September is when we do our harvest because all yeah. that's behind us. But I guess relating the season back to you referring to the, uh, the, the, the metabolic rate of the cooler temperatures, yeah. We're getting our cold fronts in, in Louisiana sometime mid-September, late September, yeah. and October. So if that season doesn't happen in the 1st of September, we risk cold fronts coming in where that, does that alligator quit eating? Yeah, what happens, the biggest alligator is the first one to quit eating. So your catch will be five, six, seven footers. Your big eight, nines, and tens. And what they do, they go through hypoglycemic shock. All the sugar runs out of the blood. So they have no appetite. They may kill something, but they won't eat it. So that explains in September if we've had an early 
cool front and we get these 60 degree mornings, we don't catch near as many. We have to set more lines to That's catch right. the same set amount of gators. Lines and you're going to be catching smaller gators. But, you know, and sum, sum it up, I think with the adequate regulations that we have protecting the alligator, in the interest the landowners have shown in protecting alligator habitat with the uh, quipper projects, coastal restoration projects, and also the good laws that we have governing the alligator. In Louisiana today, it's a damn good time to be an alligator. Talk a little bit about uh, if this was to go away. We've worked so hard to get it back. What would be the detrimental side well, of it if it was to go and we weren't able to hunt? Yeah, if, if, if we measure, managed under total protection, you say this is a sacred cow, we're not going to kill it. Populations are going to ex explode. People are going to be aggravated by the number of alligators. And they're going to start shooting them, just like People shoot snakes, and that's a waste. That animal could bring two and three hundred dollars to the landowner to put some of that money back into the land and keep it wet and wild. That's the important thing. That's why Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries went so far to establish an alligator season and pay for all of that research done at Rockville. So what you're saying, if we don't hunt them, it could become an all-out war on them, and, exactly. they could, and they could be eliminated. Exactly, because they'll, the landowners, if they get too crowded, if they get into your fish and get into the duck blinds, and we had two big ten-footers caught under one duck blind with on the same line. Wow! He bit one line, the other gator came to eat him, and he got twisted in the line. And when they pulled them up, there were two big ten-footers there. So. That's going to happen. We don't want people to get hurt. We don't want dogs to get eaten. We got to live with the resource. And through science, we can then convey this information to the general public on how to live. How do you live with two million alligators in the state of Louisiana? Uh, you know, you do it with a harvest. We kill 35,000 a year and we ship them to these different countries, Singapore, Japan, and into Europe. So it has a value, and that's what's keeping the alligator going, and that's what's keeping the landowner managing not only for alligators, but for ducks and fish and everything else. And saving the marsh. <laughs> exactly. That marsh is going to be here for our generation and the next generation and for the delight of unborn generations. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty part about it. Now, if it would be just put on an, in an ivory tower, no one would have any respect for it. And that's a tragedy. We don't want that to happen. So these guys with express boats are actually from Arkansas, and we're starting to hear reports now that they have alligators in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Have they always been there, or yeah, are they moving yeah. up there? On the southern tier of Arkansas, there's always been some alligators. And in the uh, two counties into Oklahoma, there's been a few alligators. That's about the northern part of the range. The alligator, they, every so often you find an alligator in Real Foot Lake in Tennessee. Yep, well, uh, Memphis guy. We, yeah. We've actually had within the last six months or so sightings of alligators yeah. in the Memphis area. Yeah, okay, but what happens, Mother Nature controls that. As that water freezes over, that alligator goes into hibernation and he's not strong. He can't push through that ice. Some of them, when they feel the ice freezing around them, they go into an icing response. I've seen alligators in the marsh with the water frozen all around their nose, just sticking up in the marsh. Now, when that happens, his body temperature is brought down so low he gets pneumonia, He'll haul out on the bank, and I've walked up on some big 10, 11, 12-footers, bleeding from the nose because his lungs are full of blood, and he's going to die. So that's what regulates the northern movement of alligators. He, he's in a subtropical climate. Crocs have to live in tropics. They cannot hibernate. So if you brought a croc here, he'd do fine in the summer, but he'd die in the winter. Right. Yeah. That's why you don't have crops here in Louisiana. 
And there are some crops in Florida, like in the furthest down near the in, Keys. In the very tip of Florida, you have the American crop. And it's a nice big crop, but it lives in the very southern tip of Florida. It never freezes. It's almost like a tropical climate. Right. In fact, Florida is now having problems with uh, these big snakes they're letting go because they can live in there. And the alligator, the, the croc is, is the same thing. It can live there, but it can't move very far north. So, uh, you know, we could talk for days on this, and you can tell he's a wealth of information. What a wealth. But i got to ask one more question before we wrap this interview up. And Mark had the privilege of shooting one yesterday right at 10 foot, and everybody that gets a big one, they automatically say, how old is that alligator? Yeah. How, old, when, how long okay. does an alligator live? A 10 footer would probably be somewhere around 15 to 20 years old. And... For him to grow from 10 foot to 11 foot, it probably takes a 10 footer eight years to do that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But when you look at the alligator, the mass of the alligator, he's growing in, in width. He's not growing in total length. So he's putting on 150 pounds in width and only growing two inches. So that's why alligators live to be very old and do quite well. We, we developed methods of aging alligators. Anything that hibernates has a slow growing period and a summer fast growing period. He lays down annual rings just like a tree. You can look at it and see these annual rings. It's confusing because you've got to know what false annuli are. Uh, and, and where would those rings show up at? At the long bone in the leg. Good. So we can cut it real thin, project light through it, and you can see these rings. It helps when you have a known age animal to compare to and say, well, this isn't an annual ring. This was a drought we had, mm -hmm. and he slowed up his growth because it was a drought. So you, you have to kind of play it by ear. But the, uh, the big 12-footers could be 35, 40 years old. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Man, it, it's tremendous information. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the give you a prime example here at Gros Savant. We just finished our last day of alligator season today and we ran almost a hundred people here. We had Canada represented. Uh, we had some doctors from Houston that were actually from China. Oh. Uh, we had Oklahoma, North Carolina, Good. you name it. So we've got a, a broad spectrum of people that are interested in alligators and uh, of course they're all looking at the harvest end of it but don't think people truly realize how much science is going behind no. that and, and I know the society, I know you don't, you're a very humble guy, but you are the guy that's really created a lot of this interest in this over the years. And so. Thank you, Doug, but there's a lot of good uh, people like Larry yeah. McNeese and Alan right. Ensminger that worked with us in the trenches to convey to these anti groups. That's the most challenging part of my position to take a bunch of antis, don't hunt, don't fish and don't like anybody who does hunt and fish. Yeah. And then to convince them it's to the benefit of the resource to kill 35,000 every year. They go through the roof. Yeah. You know, they just can't see yeah. it. But, like I said, the first 10 years of the alligator comeback was under total protection. But when you waste even alligators, you better do something. Mm -hmm. Because you're about to lose the whole program. And that's what we did. Well, we certainly thank you for your time. I mean, this has been a really cool thing. As much as I've been involved in it, I still learn something every time I talk to him. And certainly hope the viewers of Express Outdoors have learned something today that they can take back home and learn that exactly what's going on with alligators and why we do what we do. And it's not just a, a hunt or a harvest. There's, there's science behind it. And so, The whole thing about alligators or any wildlife, there's natural mortality taking place every year. And we know so many alligators are going to die. Fish die. People die. You can't prevent that. So you run mortality curves. And if we can lose 10 to 15 percent of the alligators, why can't we harvest part of that population that's going to die anyway? We're supplementing natural mortality with hunting mortality. That's what hunting's all about. I don't care if it's fish. I don't care if it's ducks or deer or anything else. And we're just 
as professionals, you know how much to harvest without hurting the overall population. And that's where y'all come in. Y'all have been running hunting clubs for 15, 20 years and doing a great job. And we still waste deep in alligators, fish, and ducks. Mm -hmm. So it's not hurting. Hope everyone enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Boat. Ted Johan is such a great guy, and he's a wealth of information, and it's always a treat to sit down and get to pick his brain and learn stuff about alligators. You know, if you watched the last episode of Express Outdoors, you probably saw a clip where we were talking about Hurricane Laura. He had almost a year to the date that we had filmed all these episodes. And people say that lightning doesn't strike twice in one place, but Hurricane Delta, six weeks later, has now hit southwest Louisiana for two hurricanes in a row. And Ted Johanna, along with Gros Savon, has been the victims of these two hurricanes. And since this episode with Ted Johanna, he has completely lost his house. The wind uh, basically took most of the roof off and has destroyed it. And he's currently living in a travel trailer and says he's determined to rebuild and enjoy Southwest Louisiana again. So along with Gros Savon and, and all the damage that's in these areas right now in Southwest Louisiana, we want to again reach out and thank everyone for their prayers and their thoughts. We've had a tremendous outreach of people wanting to help us and we thank all of you guys for that. So just wanted to, to let y'all know that we are coming back. Our reopening has been a little bit delayed because now we've been hit with a double whammy, but Gros Savon is gonna be better than it ever was. We're gonna continue to improve on the uh, experience that we present. And again, we wanna thank everybody for, for their thoughts and prayers and we hope you continue watching Express Outdoors.